So our next presentation will be given by Al Hirschbaum of the National Park Service's Great Lakes Inventory and Monitoring Network, and it will cover characterizing 19 years of disturbances in and around Voyager's National Park. Try a different mic. That uh, last one was cutting in and out a little bit. So, well, thank you, Ryan. And uh, this is my first time here at this forum. I'm uh, happy to be here to share the work that, of our long-term monitoring program. Uh, where we've been characterizing disturbances here at Voyagers National Park. I'll go over a quick outline of what we'll be talking about today: is the study area, uh, methods that we use, the results that we found, and some of the conclusions that we can draw from this work. Our study area uh, included 420,000 hectares, and, uh, which is 11 watersheds in Canada and Minnesota. And then Voyagers National Park there is the, uh, is the purple right in the center, and the star is where we are today. So the, in order to do this work, we use Landsat imagery as the foundation for the study. Uh, Landsat has 30 meter pixel size, and is available from 1985 until present. It uh, passes over the same spot on the Earth every 14 days, and we use one uh, composite image, which is a cloud-free image, for each year in the time series from uh, in that time, in that phenological window that we're shooting for is July and August. So there's around, depending on the year, there's you know maybe eight, maybe six images that we can choose for July and August, which are the basically the peak greenness. We want to keep that variable uh, the same year after year. As an example, this is a image from July 12th, July 20th, and August 5th. And in each one of those, there are some clouds. This is the exact same spot on the Earth. And we take the clouds out of the July 12th image, take them out of the July 20th, take them out of the <laughs> August 5th, and then in the end, in 1999, for example, we have a cloud-free image. Some years this is better than others, and some years we can't even come up with one completely cloud-free image, but we use what we have. After we've assembled all of these images in, in this time series and created all the composite images, we use a, a set of deter disturbance detection computer algorithms collectively known as Land Trender. This was developed by a group out at Oregon State University. And this algorithm aims to capture change and ignore all the other variables, all the other noise that we see from year to year. And this is an example. Um, on the y-axis is the normalized burn ratio, which is basically another surrogate for how, how green something is on the ground. And then on the x-axis are the years from 1985 until present. So you could, this is just one particular pixel, one 30 by 30 meter pixel on the ground. You can kind of view this as a pixel's life. And you can see how it goes um, from 1985 until around 2006, just kind of bouncing each year from, um, you know, just a little inner annual variability, which is not what we're technically interested in. And then in 2006, uh, Something happens to that particular pixel, drops in greenness, and then after that, starts coming back up. So what we're interested in is what the, is the disturbance. So we try to capture those and ignore the rest of them. After the algorithms are run on the entire time series, we apply a filter to create polygons, just little circles on the ground that are, have likely changed. And those are ascribed a year during the algorithm when it's running, it ascribes a year to that. And then we uh, eliminate anything that's smaller than one hectare, because a lot of times we get a lot of speckle out in the landscape, you know, one or two pixels that are grouped together, but we want larger areas, and in this case, we choose about one hectare. So anything smaller than a hectare, we're not detecting as far as a, a change. In this case, for Voyagers National Park, we validated all of these polygons, which from 1995 until 2013, which ended up being 18,805 polygons to go through. During the validation of these eight, well, almost 20,000 polygons, 
if they were false, um, by using air photos and, and other imagery that we have available to us, we say, well, that was false. The, the algorithm did not do a correct job. It was seeing something else. We might get as false. But if they were true, then we say, well, what was the disturbance agent? And here we have a list of disturbance agents that we're able to <coughs> confidently ascribe to these um, polygons. Development, which also includes conversion from forest to ag, which is kind of agricultural disturbance, but that's in development. Beaver, uh, blowdown, fire, forest harvest at three different levels, uh, basically clear cuts and then anything less than a clear cut where they go in and thin. Forest pathogens, and if it's something that we can't describe a change agent to, but something did actually happen, then we just call it other. I'll just walk you through one example here of forest harvest. The plant tracker, the computer algorithm said this change occurred in 2005, so we look at an air photo, something a high resolution before 2005. This is the polygon, the little area that plant tracker delineated, so before 2005 it was a forest. Then we look at an air photo after 2005, and sure enough, it was a, uh, a clear cut that occurred here. So we would say, true, this was a disturbance, and the disturbance agent was uh, forced harvest. We can also look at the spectral trajectory. We had additional questions about this. This is this, the trajectory of this one particular of a pixel inside that patch, and we can see that early on, for most of that little pixel's life, it was a forest happily bouncing around, and then what Landtrander picked up was the, the drop in greenness, or in NVR, mark that as a change, and, and they group those pixels together. Here's another example of a disturbance agent inside Voyager's National Park. But, uh, here, this is a, a, a disturbance that occurred due to a beaver. Um, the change occurred in 2006, this is what Landtrander had, had said. So here is a before image um, with a little polygon for land trender. There you can see it was water, so it was uh, a dam. Either, either the beaver was present or it wasn't burned when it recently left. And then after 2006, the dam um, was relieved, the water all left, and then it's starting to come back now as a, a herbaceous uh, vegetation. And here's the trajectory for this particular uh, disturbance where we can see in the, from 1985 until around 2004, it, it, it bounced around, it, it was um, dry, that's what the, uh, uh, these pixels here, or these dots here, uh, correspond generally to the color on the ground, so this was kind of a drier, or, or at least herbaceous, and the beaver came in and flooded it here, and then uh, the dam broke, and then that's when we see our, our change that was found by land trender, and it grew back to a meadow. Uh, interestingly, we also catch the, so that was when a beaver left, the dam failed, and it came back as herbaceous, but we also catch it when a beaver comes in and floods an area and kills the trees, so we capture that as well. But only if the trees die as a result of the beaver coming in and flooding the area. After we've validated and described changes to all those 20,000 polygons, then, then the fun time begins with summarization. So I'll just bring you back to that study area again with all the different watersheds and Voyagers National Park there. So this is the results from uh, 1995 until 2013. Or remember I, I said that Landsat went back to 1985, but for this um, study we only validated polygons back in 1995 due to time restrictions and, um, uh, and the lack of very good <coughs> imagery before 1995 as well. So these results would be from 1995 to 2013. Inside the park, uh, we see that beaver has been one major change agent that's been consistent through time, which is of, of some interest. We also see a few different blowdown events that have occurred in the park. Uh, I'm sorry, and on the y-axis is the percent of the inside the park was uh, disturbed, so percent of location on the y. And then a, a couple uh, fire events, uh, the major one in 2003 or 2004 was the uh, Shupak Lake fire. And then the, in, the, in the next year, in 2005, there were a few trees that um, died as a result of the initial fire in 2004. If we look outside the park, uh, 
so this is all lands outside the park, including Canada and Minnesota, with, but not the park itself. You see that, again, beaver being a, a major uh, player as far as being consistent through time outside the park. And again, percent of location was on the y-axis. However, in, in this case, the, the percent of location is a water bubbling up here. Should I be alarmed? Or? <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry about that. Um, the beaver being a consistent through time. Development also was very low, but it was also consistent through time, a little bit in each year. And then the major disturbance agent that we saw outside the park, which was uh, not a huge surprise, which was forest harvest, which averaged around 1% of the land each year being harvested outside the park. If we just compare inside versus outside to put a, a little more perspective on this, um, there we can see, that, again, now the y-axis is the same for both inside and outside, and they're very similar, um, inside versus outside. And then, of course, we see the lack of forest harvest inside the park. And if we take a, uh, take a look at just the spatial distribution of all these disturbances, um, with uh, forest harvest being green and a couple other ones that are uh, clearly visible or blowdown that occurred down in the um, southeastern part of the park, we also see these um, areas with a, a lack of any forest harvest and, and uh, not many disturbances at all that are occurring, uh, that are not occurring outside the park, which is of interest. And then, of course, we see the, the blowdown that occurred down in the Boundary Waters Canoe area back in 2008, I believe. We can also take a look at these disturbance agents by ownership type. Here, I've just broken it out into three different ownerships, federal ownership in the U.S., other, and state. Of the, in the state of Minnesota. Here we see beaver being about the same across ownership types in this case. And then we can take a look at forest harvest and the federal forest harvest would be because of the U.S. Forest Service and the other. We're going to take a little bit closer look at the forest harvest included in this other ownership types. We're going to break out that one into a little more detail. If we take a look here at the percent of land harvested by each individual ownership type, and to keep this at a, uh, to keep it simpler, I've just included uh, any ownerships that have had a thousand acre, a thousand hectares or more ownership. And here we can see harvest rates by the Northwest Paper Company in one year reaching almost 3% of their land. Uh, Boise Cascade is right around 1.5% per year. Uh, Crown lands there in, in Canada to the north um, just around 1% per year. Um, and then other private land uh, around 1% as well, which is uh, from talking locally to, in our county forest, which does a lot of forest harvesting there. Their goal is to harvest around 2% of their land holdings per year. That's what their um, rotation is uh, looking to be so for, uh, to keep it sustainable and to make sure that there's, they're manage, managing the timber effectively. We can also take a look at um, these results by watershed. Um, here are the three watersheds that are largely located within the, within the park, uh, Namakin, Rainy, and Cabotoma, although there's some, each of those has a little bit of land outside the park as well, and that's why we see forest harvest occurring in, in some of those. But largely they're, they're being um, very low compared to most of the other watersheds that we have. And in the Ash River and Vermilion uh, River watersheds, you see that the harvest rates have declined starting in around 2006, 2007, in both of those watersheds. And at a, at a different park, we noticed that there was a, a large decline in forest harvest after 2008, which we thought was kind of interesting and didn't know if that was at all due to the housing crash that we experienced in the US or not. Um, so some of the conclusions that we can draw, that we draw from this uh, study, um, 
really allows us to be able to put the, the entire national park into a larger context by being able to monitor such a large amount of land inside and outside the park. We can start seeing that these large areas to the north and to the east that are largely forest harvest free could be providing some important corridor, animal corridors for the park. Uh, we've seen, we saw some high rates of forest harvest in some watersheds by some ownership types. We're not saying that those are necessarily unsustainable harvest rates, but it is interesting to be able to look at the harvest per watershed because I don't necessarily think that certain ownership types look at it, look at it by a watershed perspective, but if you're over harvesting one watershed, that could, that could lead to um, additional sedimentation, uh, a lot of downstream effects. So being able to monitor uh, these watersheds are is important. As I, as I mentioned, you know, these large areas outside the park, if we were just looking at the park itself, we would have really had a, a very good clue of what was happening outside. So, you know, these areas could be reprised, be providing um, very and crucial uh, wildlife corridors. We also saw these lower, lower rates of development outside the park, uh, although the one interesting thing with development is that usually, typically, once it is developed, it is no longer coming back to forest, whereas things like forest harvest or fire or blow down there, you know, that, that trajectory of um, you know, forest will come back, but um, development is usually a, a one-way trajectory, so we continue to like to see, this, see the development um, a little bit lower. And, you know, it seems like the park is largely, you know, functioning as a refugia for allowing these natural processes like fire and blowdown to occur and, and uh, recover on their own. And, you know, the, the, it seems like the, there's been a fair amount of just keep, uh, fever disturbance inside the park. And um, we'll just continue to monitor that over time. So, uh, thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take those. The forest pathogens, we typically can't say specifically what it is, but a lot of times it's forest path, or is it a, is it gypsy moth or, or forest tent caterpillar? You pointed out several large areas outside of the park that did not have any disturbance. Um, could you touch on why those areas weren't disturbed? Well, I, I'm not uh, exactly sure why all of those are not, um, yeah. why they weren't disturbed. I, there is a management area of Lacroix, Lacroix to the um, southeast that's a coal management, and that may have something to do with the large area uh, down here. There's a, a little bit of the Boundary Waters canoe area as well down there. Uh, but for instance, like this large peninsula here that's coming in, or here, I don't have any good answer as to why. I looked at ownership types for Canada, and I can't exactly can't see any large provincial parks or anything there. Um, 
it could just possibly be inaccessibility. Although in 2017, I find it hard that we that we can't access that, but it could be. I have one forestry uh, catalyst to show. It seems like the valve stack the original pixel color for like one or two years. Is that just heat trout on the on the like uh, gum trees? The deposits already bounced back to the Right, so the question was uh, on the forest harvest example that I gave, the bounce back after the, the clear cut came right back to the prior levels of, of greenness or of NBR. And typically that occurs in in a forest like a, an aspen clear cut. For example, an aspen come back after one year with all of the um, roots sprouting, they come up and you know they may only be a meter or two tall after a year, but they're very green, they're very thick. And, and that's the signal that we see coming back. And that's, typical, that's typically what we see in a, more of an Aspen clear cut where things come back so quickly. Yeah, so but for, it, for an example like that, you would want to use that as a metric of like, things are not as good as they were in terms of the, the, the biomass of the forest, just they look the same. That's right, yep, yep, exactly. <clears throat> Your um, minimum harvest of a thousand hectares for private landowners is, is a bar that might not be comparable to the industrial forest harvest for the uh, some of the, the private or public forest harvest. Have you thought about looking at um, smaller cuts? To because I suspect the acreage would be higher in that comparison if you don't use. Yeah, as large of a, a block. Um, yeah, I, so you mentioned a, a thousand hectares. But I thought that was your minimum harvest uh, that you would consider when you were looking at the forest harvest component relative to ownership. No, the, the, we, will, uh, we will delineate and attribute anything, uh, any patch that is one hectare or larger. Your so graph we, showed the thousand. Yeah, but for the graph, I only included ownership types in the graph that had a thousand hectares of ownership. Okay. So gotcha. in that one, for example, any private, any private individual would have been in the private category. So in that case, that's where it, we do anything smaller than a hectare, though we would not be able to. Sorry, John. Sure, we're going to move to the next talk, but thank you very much, Al.